<laughs> okay, guys, so we are live now on YouTube. I'm going to just uh, announce the channel in a second on, a, on our Slack. Just in a second. So for everyone on Slack, there is now a YouTube channel. So you can ask questions on YouTube also and uh, on Zoom. So let's go. At uh, six o'clock uh, uh, today, we, are, we have some great guests to our meetup, uh, AWS User Group uh, Belgrade. Uh, we are talking about uh, moving to the cloud and uh, why would someone move to the cloud and uh, 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 if, if you don't need, why, why would we push you? Or, or if, if you want, uh, why don't you start and stuff like that? So we have uh, uh, many different uh, uh, paths to go on when we think about moving to the cloud. And uh, uh, we'll try to put a lot of different perspectives here from different uh, uh, client perspectives for you. <clears throat> so uh, uh, if we don't ask uh, some questions, please just feel free to, to, to interrupt us and, and uh, ask. And, uh, you don't need to be really technically deep in AWS to understand what we are going to talk about today. Uh, uh, as this story is uh, uh, more or less the same for for any cloud, any cloud that comes comes up in the future. So we, we don't we don't see that this is the end of, of all the cloud uh, providers. These four, gang of four or something. So just uh, th this is mostly related to to AWS because AWS is first and the, the biggest but also relates to, to, to those others in the market. So uh, uh, today we have uh, uh, Tommy Beck and Nemanja Kostic uh, uh, as our guests. So uh, we, wanna, we wanna ask a lot of questions today. So uh, Nemanja, Tommy, you have like 60 seconds for uh, each to, to say something about yourself. Is it <coughs> yeah, uh, so 60 you, seconds you just enough. Yeah. You start, Tommy. <laughs> yeah. So hi, yeah, I'm Tommy. Um, I'm originally a uh, Finn. Um, living since long time in, in Switzerland and in technology pretty much my whole life. Uh, currently, um, the last, I would say, eight years more or less in, in the startup space. But I, I've been, um, let's say, long time in, in, uh, in telco. I used to work at Nokia back home. Then I've been in, in finance and algo trading for six years, so high frequency trading. And then kind of segued into where all the action is, which is kind of the cutting edge technologies and startups and greenfield projects and all, all this, which is cloud. It's also very much blockchain and um, digital products in, in, in the end. But as we know, cloud is kind of central for a lot of services. And that's really what, what kind of a lot of the work I'm doing with clients um, where things are, are happening. But yeah, I mean, I depends. I could talk a lot about the different, different things I've been doing, but because it's a uh, cloud, Basically, what I'm, I'm mo mostly involved in is, is kind of bootstrapping new projects. Uh, can be in enterprise, um, like big companies that want to do and explore new things. Uh, can be startups, can also be mid-sized companies that want to really push, especially innovation, and look at how do you build um, um, uh, products today and what are the tools. And obviously, then you immediately come to cloud. So this is something I'm mainly focusing on since now. Okay, years. Tommy, you're out of time now. So Nemanja, say something, say something about you. <laughs> okay, you're really strict. <laughs> yeah, we don't have time for this. Personal, <laughs> personal <laughs> stuff, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, hi everybody. My name is uh, Nemanja Kosic and um, um, yeah, uh, similar to Tommy, I've been um, uh, for many years in, in IT and I think now 20 years uh, working professionally. Um, mostly as a, as a Java developer for a very long time and then moved to solution architecture and later enterprise architecture. I live in Switzerland, Zurich, uh, where I have been uh, working with uh, many um, uh, companies from financial services sector. And last five years, almost exclusively 100% uh, focusing on AWS. Um, I was for four years part of AWS as a solution architect. And uh, since recently, um, I went on my own and uh, have my own uh, consulting company where, again, I'm focusing uh, exclusively on uh, AWS. Uh, my customers vary from uh, startups to large enterprises and uh, uh, I help them uh, in a different ways from um, 
preparation to moving to the cloud to hands-on implementation and uh, uh, doing the design of um, uh, cloud native architectures. So today, hopefully we'll address some of these things and um, uh, my feedback will mostly be based on experience that I have seen working with customers. Yeah. So, so you, you actually work in, uh, in AWS uh, and uh, have some like a <laughs> real in, internal experience on how it looks from that perspective. So that's another that's another value for today's discussion. So, but now you're free to talk about anything. You know, can can, can we ask yes. you any question? You're not like connected with some like yeah, no, no more NDA, that's... no more NDAs. I can uh, tell no. you under, under the hood how it works. You are free, free man. <laughs> All now. secrets are out now. All yeah, secrets. Okay. Are, I know everything about Jeff. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, we have like a few slides with a lot of questions and uh, uh, just. Uh, uh, the first one uh, uh, is about like who are the clients, who are, who, who, who are, who's actually asking the question, but uh, why should I move to the cloud? Should I move to the cloud? So, so let, let's see, uh, let's see who are these, uh, who are these people who are, uh, who are just uh, now looking for these actual answers. So let, let's try to put all the, uh, the answers uh, that we have today in perspective on, on, of all these different uh, uh, companies. I would say that in most cases, startups are now actually starting in the cloud. They don't even think about doing anything on premise. It's it, many different types of clouds, many software and service solutions like, uh, like WordPress or something, but, but in, in, uh, in some really big uh, guys, uh, guys who are trying to get big, like they're, they're actually starting the startup with, with the cloud. So I would say that that's pretty much solved. But uh, we have like, uh, uh, especially in, in Central Europe and in, uh, 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 in small medium enterprises were making like 90% of the market. So let, let's try to give answers about them. Uh, let's, let's, let's give an answer about technical uh, uh, tech companies who are doing software for these small and medium enterprises also. Why are they not moving and why they should move or, or whatever. And also of course the perspective of large enterprises who are sometimes very agile and also very slow in, in, in some terms. And, and, then, and the last perspective from the government's uh, point of view and uh, how some governments actually manage to do that in, in a good way and some are not moving and why. So let, let's, let's try to, to, to always uh, give all the perspectives if we can. Okay, so we need to talk fast. Good guys. So the big question is like, why would I move? So what was the point? Why, why are you pushing me? Well, so guys, what do you say about that? Well, do we have to move? Do, does everyone have to move to the cloud? You want to start? Yeah, yeah, just, just <laughs> okay, sure. anyone. Start. Just, yeah, we can so you don't have an answer? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Why would you move? Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> I mean, uh, coming back to your client perspective, um, uh, definitely all of those clients that you, you mentioned there, they are all really um, uh customers of uh, of cloud any cloud we're not going to focus on any specific um, uh, we don't have to uh, but wh why would you move that's that's a, a good question so th there are certain cloud benefits right and uh, uh, i think when i'm talking to customers first i'm trying to understand what are their pain points and and there are always some pain points right and uh, uh, there are certain customers that just don't see the uh, point of moving to the cloud at this particular stage. So they are maybe uh, dealing with, uh, let's say with the current COVID situation, it's not easy for them to make a new investment and uh, uh, to right now to move there. Maybe even if they see the potential of the cloud, maybe they're being stopped by existing contracts with some uh, on-premise vendors that they're tied for next couple of years and they can't do anything. And sometimes they're not even actually realizing what are the cloud benefits out there. So uh, what are the benefits now? Like just, yeah. yeah. So I would, I would just say a couple of, uh, of things, right? Uh, let's say things that you absolutely cannot have on premise today, right? So uh, my, my first one would always be security. So uh, tools that cloud, clouds are providing to you in the security space are absolutely something that uh, nobody has uh, on premise uh, today. Let's focus on AWS because now I just know AWS the best, but something like cloud trail service that, you know, just writing down, um, logging every API call that you made. So uh, 
it gives you full transparency who did what and when. You can't have that on premise. I, I haven't seen it unless you implemented something really from the beginning that covers the whole spectrum of your applications and infrastructure on premise. This is uh, uh, in reality probably you, you haven't. Second one is. Um, um, artificial intelligence services, machine learning uh, based services that uh, there's abundance of those services in the clouds that you can just pick and, and use. This is you, a, you, do you mean like service where they recognize which, is it a cat or is it, is it, a, is it a dog? Why is that dog. important, important to, to me? I'm, 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 a, I'm a company doing like, a, I'm producing cakes, I don't know, or, or chocolate. Yes. Well, why do I need that kind of uh, artificial? I, I'll give you. I'll give you an example. Actually, from that industry, I had a customer who, at the end of the production line in the factory, uh, uh, there were there were like two people who were detecting the uh, when. Uh, cakes or those products that were from uh, this industry um, uh, had some defects and they were then manually removing them. So there was a project to actually uh, uh, with the image recognition to try to tr train the model to recognize the defect products. And there is like a arm, robotic arm that just automatically removes but, that. But you can you can still do, do this thing on premise. You can, you can still train stuff and, and do stuff by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. wh why is it better in the cloud? Yeah. Maybe, yeah, I, I think, I think like, one, of, one of the points there, I mean, what, what this is kind of going into is, is obviously you, you have more flexibility and it depends then completely what, what's your business, what are you doing? But definitely if you're in the cloud, like obviously you can do everything on-prem. <clears throat> Probably it's going to be very expensive and you need a lot of engineers. And uh, for instance, like security that came up, they're, they're, security is like one of the biggest topics and there are not that many, you know, if you look globally, people that are, you know, elite when it comes to security. And then where are they working? You know, should everybody, every company have, have a staff of these elite security experts or operations or machine learning experts or this or this or this. So you get into like the whole range of, of, of uh, uh, expertise that you won't be able to, to uh, even, even get irrespective if you're a small company or a cake maker or a tech company or whatever it is. So you get into this, these problems where these, these resources, people, skills, but services are available abundantly in the cloud that you can actually use and tap into instead of have to have all this on-prem. And that, then that's like the starting point. Then you, you can add then, okay, are you a company that actually build custom software for yourself or for others? If not, well, then maybe it's this cake thing minus the, the let's say the, the AI part or the ML part, but otherwise you could just take off the shelf quite you know, high level um, services that fit into running you know, WordPress, but even, even more so. And we are going towards AI, if you know like Snowflake and, and, uh, and other companies, Palantir, these are all like moving, you know, the higher up in this uh, abstraction or in the in the in the level of services that will become off the shelf, integratable into any type of business. And and this is like mm -hmm. cloud is just the infrastructure, but this is like pushing up now, like yeah. infrastructure, which we maybe think hardware, and then we get into managed services. But this is just increasing to become more affordable and much more flexible to just pick and use. Anyway. Yeah. 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 So these these things that people think that they're in the cloud, like infra, that the, just like infrastructure, in the last couple of years, they, they actually transformed to a really high level services, like uh, personalized in AWS or, or, or stuff like that, that, that really uh, can, uh, that are taken from Amazon.com and, and they can help you to, uh, to suggest products to customer stuff. This is really this can be taken as an infrastructure, but also it's, it's a super high level uh, uh, service, which is almost baked for you. Yeah. And That's I think a, this is, yeah. and this is the, this is the trend where we should think about it like this, like, you know, like, not to become like esoteric here, but like humanity needs to constantly like layer on layer on layer to be higher up in, let's yeah. say a value chain or in, in wherever abstraction where you are adding value or creating. So obviously everything from hardware and compute and storage and, you know, and then you're just layering higher and higher. And, and as, as a business, irrespective of which business you are, what you want to um, ask yourself, like come back to this initial question, why to go to cloud is what can I buy 
cheaply that I'm not producing myself. So I can focus on yeah. the things I'm producing where I can add value. And the other things you should just buy, yeah. not make your so, own computers, right? Yeah. So the stack, the stack that we are dealing with is very high and it's, it's crazy to go from the bottom to the top again. So we have to start from, from the top, yeah. But uh, is there, do you think that there is a, a kind of a threat model in this, uh, in this movement to the cloud? Like uh, uh, I've heard like, in five years, you will not be able to buy your, your, your servers by your own because you will, there will, no one will just be selling servers to you. In five years, you will not be able to find a person who is like, uh, uh, who is able to maintain the network or stuff like that. Are, are we dealing with some, that kind of a threat also? I think so. I mean, the, 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 look, the skills shortage is already apparent today. You know? So today in the market, it's, uh, uh, there is a fight for good resources, right? For, for good people. And um, in, uh, like just, just imagine like some uh, uh, traditional financial institution, be it a bank or insurance or, or whatever, uh, that doesn't matter how much uh, they can pay you uh, uh, per month or per year. Uh, the the new like millennials that are coming out of university and guys, I mean, th there is no money in the world that you would uh, uh, give to them so that they can work on your 20 year old IT stack, right? Uh, that is a real problem that many companies are are facing, and some of them are seeing a cloud benefit as if we take out all of the things we, we discussed so far as a way to attract new talent. So. Uh, how would you, uh, if you're like a cloud native company, uh, there are people who are going to apply for jobs there very easily. And if your uh, company saying like, oh, we, we have uh, 2 million codes of uh, uh, Java uh, uh, enterprise beans, so 1.2 version, uh, would you come and work for us? Nobody yeah. will come to work for you, right? So uh, <clears throat> this, is a, this problem is going to uh, be, uh, elevated as we as we go on, and it's going to be uh, more pressing for companies. They just, if they don't see any value of the cloud, this can be the only value that they should be looking at and say, we won't have any more staff to to work for us if um, uh, if we don't do something about it. Yeah, can I ask one more question about this first uh, first question? Uh, question about the question, uh, uh, like uh, we have like small medium enterprises now, which have some stack, and it works fine. Mm -hmm. Everything works fine. And then we talked about that example, like a, a, a company which is moving to another building and another building doesn't have enough space to work for a data center. And now what to do now? So any single threat to kind of a very secure model, which is now is actually devastating to a company. But many companies are thinking, especially small, medium companies are thinking, well, this tech will work till I die. And then I don't care. So like we have, how many years can this current stack work? .NET, uh, uh, C Sharp, uh, C++, I don't know, whatever, three layer architecture, where we are now, how many years do you give to this stack? When it will, when it will die? <laughs> I mean, if, if, if your business model is uh, relying on keeping things status quo, I, I don't think you're gonna survive much longer anyway, right, your business. Right. So you need to, even if everything works great now, uh, the real question would be how easy it is to modify, to meet the new requirements. Uh, how easily can you uh, implement or go to market with new features that your users uh, want? And uh, if that is easy in your current stack, and if you're super agile and everything works fine, good. Right. Uh, keep it that way. <laughs> but how many I, years? I how many years? Like ten years? Are, are they are they dead in ten years? No. I, well, okay. The, the, so, if we're looking at what's happening, <clears throat> just to not to segue into some other topic here, but if if to answer that question from in my world, we need to look at what's happening in the crypto and blockchain space. So here here's a lot of innovation happening in in terms of compute and storage, and. Depends then how you define this three-layer model. I think fundamentally we 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 have that model in place, um, not because it's it's a bad thing. We have those those pieces we need to deal with. So we have like, you know, the, the, those pieces. They're just gonna change. Put it like this to also connect what Nemanja said before. The problem is like 
if we zoom out, what's the overall thing? It's the competition and the pace of the world, how it's evolving. So if you're using tools that one, you can't attract the right talent that are able to produce the right stuff fast enough. And also the tools are slow. Um, you know, the overall framework architecture is slow. You will buy, you know, competition, you will be out competed. So your business won't be able to survive. I think the, the models or the, the way this three layer, three tier architecture is not necessarily changing in that sense. They're still there, but the tools are changing. It will become much easier to do stuff. And again, like being higher up, you can, you can achieve things with more modern technologies much faster and much better and also attract the right people so you can you know have a thriving business i think that that's what you want to solve you know cloud or blockchains or whatever it's going to be you know depending so, on uh, I, I see you guys you are like really optimistic and see the future uh, you, you are still young and you you see yourself uh, as as someone who is going to improve yourself and uh, and and do something And mostly, uh, most many companies are just happy with, with where they are, and probably that's that's the, probably the problem. You know, are, are you going to change or stay like 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 you are doing today? So let, let's go to the second question: uh, uh, Is it is it expensive to move to the cloud? What, what are what are we dealing with now? We're dealing with like companies with try, which which are trying to move existing models, and companies which are trying to build something new. So is it is it expensive? Like, what about moving a SQL database to the cloud or, or ERP, current ERP? I would say like with everything else in, in life, if you don't know what you're doing, it's very expensive. And uh, <clears throat> so the thing is, uh, the, the, the problem with the cloud is that you have infinite resources at your disposal, right? And uh, uh, you, it, there, there is a lot of room for mistakes. So if you, if you don't know what you're doing and if there are no uh, properly set guardrails to prevent you from doing things that you don't want to do, uh, you can make a mess, right? Uh, but let's now focus on people that gain the knowledge, properly trained, they know what, you're do what, what they're doing. Uh, for them, it's not that it is not expensive, but it's probably the, uh, the cheapest thing that uh, you have ever seen in your life. Right. So uh, some of the projects that I'm, I'm working on now, I, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't be able to run on premise without a few thousand dollars. Yeah, per month. But you're starting from scratch. You're not moving. Am I yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So what, what about moving? You know, people are uh, uh, it, it's harder to move than to start from scratch. So, so I mean, when we're talking about uh, sorry, I'm just no, no, please. Uh, no, no, please. Yeah, uh, when we're talking about moving, so there are several stages of moving, right? So the uh, you're not gonna just abandon everything you have and start from scratch everywhere, right? So there, Tommy and I discussed in one of the Cloud Couch uh, episodes about the uh, migration and how you would uh, first do the application inventory and then decide which application you're gonna retire, which which you can just re-host, uh, which one you can just uh, re-platform, lift and shift in another platform, which you should just drop and buy a new one, uh, drop and shop, and which one you can actually re-architect from scratch and then introduce these cloud native services. So it is a very conscious decision, what is being moved, how, when, in what sequence, and uh, Uh, there is no binary, like we're going to move everything or we're not going to move anything. It's a, it's a very gradual process where you also learn as you go, right? What I'm trying to say, lifting and shifting stuff in the cloud and leaving it in a way it was on premise, it's not going to bring you much. It's probably going to be, it's not going to be more expensive, but it's going to be on the same level of uh, uh, cost like before. But this is not where the value comes. Value comes with further optimization and going into cloud native services. Yeah, uh, to, to add to that, and like obviously it's like multi dimensions, you know, the different perspectives to kind of evaluate what makes sense. And, um, and, and it depends completely also on the business, but I try to just simplify a bit. Um, kind of in, in general, what, what, what it is is that obviously if you have a very large let's say workload, we talk about a large company. Well, that's a different whole different story than let's say, talk about a midsize or a smaller company or a startup. You have different ways you would be looking, I would think, you know, uh, or at least how I look at it on cost, for instance. 
like if it go on, on startup and smaller companies and to me it's like let's say to me startups are all tech companies they have to have it's all tech companies and then let's say we have the mid-sized companies let's say they are these um you know baking cake or they do some other things so they, they they don't they're not in the software business to build custom software necessarily they're just you know relying on it infrastructure but if you're looking at costs here you would need to or the way i'm thinking you know first step is to just realize what are your total costs right now if you just go really basic what's the it staff you have and why do you have them and then you 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 can start looking at okay so if if you buy the same thing in 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 amazon like now we're simplifying of course but it's a bigger discussion but let's say you buy everything on demand and or how are you, you you need to to buy it in the cloud and let's for argument's sake say that aws has you know elite security people and operations and everything and they have you know great i'm not saying that the companies have bad people working for them but it's a challenge so you if you're looking at your 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 staff costs and your 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 capex and you know the opex through the the, the staff and all that when you when you transfer that over into the cloud, these smaller companies, startups, and and this it's a no brainer because the deployment for the workloads and the whole thing costs nothing. Like in 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 comparison, like there, it's just an immediate obvious if you just do the logics through that and the numbers, it's not going to be a problem. You know to get the starting point, and then on top of that, you you it, then it just depends. What's the business? You know. And how is it going to evolve if it's a startup and, and all these things? Or if it's a mid-size, what does that mean? Are, do we have other things that are, you know, more important? Now we come into these perceived risks and, you know, like maybe data topics or, or whatever it could be. But if you're just rational and you don't, you know, look at these other things just yet, it quickly gets into a situation where the money you're paying currently, you get a lot more just taking stuff um, um, yeah from- people always forget to, to, to take the everything in, in uh, calculation yeah. so like the, the human resources and stuff like that that, that uh, um, how much how much cloud do you get for a month's salary in a given yeah month? yes exactly yeah. but but the, the question is also like uh, uh, what kind of a model we have like for 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 uh, uh, cloud migration is it like a lift and shift where you take your virtual machine or or you just install your uh, uh, switch your database to a cloud database or something like that so in, in most cases such lift and shift strategies are more expensive in terms of like uh, 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 what you can do if you uh, if you do something which is really cloud native and uh, we'll talk about later about what, what what exactly is that cloud native so okay let's go to the next topic so uh, we were talking about the the, the fact that uh, uh, well, someone else there in the cloud is, is already smart, so they build the cloud. Okay, so we, we're just jumping in the cloud where everything is just great, okay? But the question is like, well, uh, do we need from our side also someone who is really smart to move this operation? Because it looks so easy, but then, well, what, what do I do? Like, and the next question is, how do I start? So should I call someone? Is it is yes. there a, a, like a like a partner network or stuff? So, yeah. So okay, no promotion. I just cut cut cut. cut, cut. So the, the, the question is like, uh, 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 do we need really super smart people for to, to move to the cloud? Because all these uh, network engineers that 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 did well doing uh, uh, Windows uh, administration and uh, SQL uh, SQL uh, database administration stuff. Well, they are probably not well suited for the for the cloud migration or, or or living in the cloud. So, do we need gurus? How do we start? I, I do a quick and then you can fill in the gaps I miss. Yeah, I think like obviously the answer, the short answer is yes. But to me, it means going into cloud, you have a chance to separate so that you can figure out what is the thing that you do best and what is the stuff that you can, you know, put in the cloud, for instance, that they do best. So you can have, say, your gurus working um, from basically your business side and then the the highest level of, let's say, your applications and that um, knowledge. But obviously, you know, so that's a no-brainer. So you have a chance to separate. The other thing is um, 
obviously if you if you in order to get there obviously you need to start and the start obviously includes having somebody who understands how to navigate into that position and understands uh, everything around um, uh, migrating into the cloud which means the, if you're going to AWS you would need somebody who can who can do that which is for instance Nemanja or myself or and then you got up yeah having, uh, a partner, having a partner to guide you but but Obviously, in the, in, the, in AWS, in, in, uh, which is like uh, super sophisticated cloud, you have some tools and templates that you can build during that process, so so, so you can leave it to the customer, and then it's a kind of a, a game uh, with the customer. Not it's it's not that the partners do everything for the customers. They, they yes. just so just uh, give us your perspective on on, on that. You have. <clears throat> more much more experience on that maybe last thing here uh, last thing it, sure. it have to be a collaborative effort you know if if you need somebody who is a guru let's say come in and like namanya said do an inventory of where things are and then have a clear plan how to best benefit from going to cloud and how your business best benefits from doing things and, and the steps in that direction it have to be that yeah, uh, I mean, uh, based on my experience, I haven't seen any company doing it right uh, on their own without any external help. Uh, the thing is, uh, and the second observation that uh, I've seen with customers is that um, everybody can be trained. Um, existing IT personnel is the easiest one to be trained on the cloud. And uh, companies are not firing people when they start moving to the cloud. They just uh, retrain them more aggressively and actually start hiring more people to help them with the uh, cloud native development. Uh, when business realizes that their IT department that was blocking things in the past uh, very aggressively now starts delivering very aggressively uh, because of the increased agility that cloud offers, the requests from the business will start coming uh, faster and more often. So that's when they realize, oh, actually we need to start hiring more, but that's a good problem to have. That means you're helping your business grow. Now, when we talk about 21st century gurus, uh, the thing is uh, you need to get a partner uh, or uh, somebody to uh, guide you uh, in this, uh, this direction. And during that, uh, the worst partner would be uh, you engage with somebody that that partner does something six months later, says, here we go, it's your account, everything works, bye-bye. Uh, uh, that, that's not going to work for you. Uh, you need a partner to, um, to train you, to teach you, educate how to use the services. Whatever they do, they need to do the knowledge transfer to your internal team. At the end of the day, you need to have at least one person in-house who knows how to operate this new environment, right? Uh, if nothing else, uh, somebody needs to be admin, needs to hold the keys of the of your account, and that cannot be external partner, right? So uh, any company, in my view, need to have internal resources trained uh, on uh, on any cloud, whatever they choose, and uh, with with the partner help to get them there, that is very important. The failures that I have seen are always the same. Um, companies thinking we're going to do it on our own, no big deal. And then they do something and that, that something is uh, insecure, not performant, not using best practices, uh, mm -hmm. not expensive exactly. And things either that, or they give everything to a partner to do something and say, we're hands, hands off. And that partner starts sucking the money out of them forever. Uh, <clears throat> I would love to do that, but that's not my model. <laughs> So <laughs> Tommy and I are, are doing it differently. And uh, uh, it's all about educating the uh, customers so that they can um, uh, do on their own. I, I would always say the best, um, my best uh, case would be that I can make myself obsolete in about six months with any customer. That they don't need so me anymore. Can, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? So one of the great things in AWS is that there is a, there's a way to, uh, to uh, make something uh, which is, uh, uh, named like an infrastructure as a code, where you can define a template of the of the entire network uh, where the application resides. So, as a as a partner, you would work with some uh, with a client, and you would produce that kind of a template, so the client can understand in in a in some kind of in a form of a file that this is what you can deploy, 
And uh, it's not like, oh, my partner was just clicking through the, through the console and they did something and we don't know what's it. And uh, uh, so, so that's one of the biggest values that you can actually produce something which can be, uh, which can be uh, uh, published in the cloud as, a, as an infrastructure. So sure, but, but not just uh, do infrastructures of code and hand it over to them and say, yep, you can yeah. do it now. It's to educate them, what have you done through this infrastructure as code to explain each and every step, why you use this service, uh, why you did it the way you, uh, it is working so that they know how to modify later on, how to expand, how to reuse uh, things. Yeah. I think that is the very important uh, um, a part of the partnership with with any customer. Yeah, and so. I, maybe to add, to add two things here, just quickly. I think the one of these uh, big mistakes that often happen to add one more to the list there is, I often also see and hear these these mistakes where you have too many parties and there is no collaboration. So it could be a big company or a mid size, whatever, and they have various bits and pieces either per organization or whatever it is. So they have several external um, parties that are collaborate or let's say they should collaborate to do the migration, but it doesn't happen. And it's more like, okay, here are clear uh, responsibilities and the overall doesn't, doesn't work out well. So to me, it's, it should be, you know, it's so key to have a, a, a full collaboration. All what Nemanja said about uh, educating and keeping, you know, the customer in the loop, because we as, a, as somebody who would guide them need to kind of get in the head of the business owner also to understand how do we best move this over into the cloud and how can I provide the value showing how that, that migration uh, roadmap looks like and then educate bit by bit how, what we're doing and why we're doing that. And of course, then um, uh, understanding the, the right selections of, of basically everything from database to, to, um, to the overall solution. And um, yeah, so that, that's really something that, that uh, comes out. The other thing I, I just want to add is, is on uh, infrastructure as code. I mean, this is such a, I mean, I hear it all the time that uh, this is kind of left as an exercise, you know, even in like the biggest migrations that are done by big companies like, you know, Accenture or whatever, uh, they don't do that, you know. And, and that's like the, the number one thing I do and where I start, and I know also Nemanja, this is like, you know, where you start, I mean, you don't want to have something which is not like, um, well, okay, if I take a step back so everybody understands uh, or depend, depending on, on um, what you understand about the infrastructure as code, but this is like you're scripting. I, I often take this cooking book and you have recipes inside and you write down the recipes, obviously. And then imagine you can feed in the pages into a machine that bakes then the bread or something. That's basically what it's about. You write things down and that's like, I need a database and I need this and I need that. And this is how it's connected. And then you deploy it like that by code. And that's like obvious that you want to do because then it's in one place. You have like full transparency. You can audit it. You can look at it. It's not like, yeah, something was clicking somewhere and now we have yeah. something. You know? <laughs> some rep reproduce yeah. Reproducibility is yeah. important. It's like it's all so benefits and no so overhead. It's, it's, so when we ask why would I move, like what this is uh, uh, having infrastructure as a code, these templates to, to produce environments, to produce these servers, stuff like that, just from a file. That's one of the things that 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 the reason why not, why, why would I move to the cloud actually? <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's yeah. that's true. And the, the thing is, many many large companies. Um, I remember in financial in the industry when I was working as a solution architect, it was always the this was always the struggle. Your production environment is never the same like pre-prod UAT SIT yeah. development. Never because we don't have money to buy that many servers like it's in production. Yeah. So it works in SIT, but then when we deploy to production, it doesn't work because some components are missing. Yeah. With infrastructure as code, you don't have this problem anymore. The script you used for production is the same it's script same. that you can exactly. uh, spin up SIT, test, uh, UAT, whatever environment. And then just destroy it after that. Um, so you have one-on-one -on -one, uh, how the production uh, setup looks like. Good. So uh, there was one comment from Daniel Djukovic, and uh, uh, it's a, it's a nice one. Like, uh, and that's something that actually I did by, by myself, you know, because I, I didn't I, uh, I, I didn't uh, uh, go uh, your way. I didn't consult any partners when I was moving to the cloud. 
So uh, I had to pay some price. Okay. And there we go. It, 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 may be, <laughs> there we go. It, it may be that that price was cheaper than actually a consult, taking the consultant <laughs> partner. But, you know, uh, uh, so, so what I'm Daniel said, just, yeah. so Daniel just said, like, well, you do the, you just, just take, just move, lift and shift, just take your servers, install it in the cloud, and bam, you're there. And, well, your first bill will be really high or will be more uh, than you expected or stuff like that. But then you will be in a in a in a problem, you know. And when you when 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 you're in a problem, you actually do start learning, you start reacting, you know. So you have to do something, and uh, it will take time. But you may actually learn in that <laughs> during that during that time. Sure. So yeah, I mean it's 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 one way, and it's not that it's bad. I think like we, we talked about this in in one it's of. It's not the, this way, not this way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the the other way. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's. it's <laughs> We, we, you can make it slightly improved, let's put it like that. So the way I usually um, approach it is um, <clears throat> if you do this inventory and you look through things, I mean, that, that's like giving you the, the first insight and conversation to minimize what you're going to lift over. And obviously what you don't want to do is lift over things that you don't need or shouldn't be you know, caring about or that can have an end of life in on-prem, for instance. So then you have less. And the other side of the, the equation is stuff that you want to re-architect and you do. Well, obviously you are not, like Daniel wrote here, you're not going to re-architect that on the fly into the cloud because that's going to oh, also burn. So what you want to do is you want to take a minimize from both those sides and you lift over at least the stuff that's going to be, you know, one to one for, you know, at least for the time being. And then you also can lift over, at least how I see it, you lift over the, the, the things that you want to re-architect. But these ones, I would potentially, you know, it's the next discussion there where maybe you don't um, lift them over all at once. Maybe you don't lift over at all because now we need to prioritize and re-architect and just deploy new stuff. And then that's the opportunity, like Nemanja said, now you can put out all the cool job ads or internally, now we're gonna do potentially serverless, you know, to be, to be decided for these new things. So it's like, yeah, and my, I agree. And my, my take is uh, uh, there are some things that you can lift and shift, but I would say moving to the cloud is probably, uh, one and only opportunity for for a company to actually uh, get rid of technical debt, uh, and it's not going to be the second chance. So when you're moving to the cloud, there are a lot of things you have to think about and rethink how you're doing it. So I would say instead of just lifting and shifting everything, and then being in the cloud and say, okay, now we're going to think what we're going to do. Uh, the thing is, you still have if there was a garbage on premise, now you have a garbage in the clouds, right? And uh, uh, probably there are a lot of things, uh, there are a lot of things uh, additionally that will hit you in the cloud that you have to now understand and you will leave this garbage in the cloud and never re-architect it. I think moving to the cloud is opportunity that should not be uh, wasted, should not be taken so uh, lightly and um, should really go step by step. And actually my recommendation to customers that are moving to the cloud is to actually do first application fully serverless cloud native. To pick one that is on premise now, it can be, uh, doesn't need to be super business critical, some smaller application that they do it fully in a serverless. And then they see like, this is, these are two extremes. We have it on premise and look how much it costs, how it's low, how it's not scaling. And this is the future and we have it in the cloud. This is where we want to be. Now, from the application that we have, maybe some we can immediately do cloud native uh, by re-architecting. The others need a couple of transitional states to get there, but we see the end benefits, right? If you lift and shift everything in the cloud and leave it like that, uh, don't forget cloud migration always creates a lot of internal resistance for whatever reason, right? Political, afraid of jobs, uh, this is not gonna work. Uh, I know we are incapable of doing this and things like that. And you want to show these people and you want to pull them on your side and say, no, it actually works. Uh, by dumping everything to the cloud the way it is, they will tell you like uh, Nelson from Simpsons, like, ha ha, I told you it doesn't work. Uh, so you want to but, avoid But that. if you decide, if you decide, I mean, if you, it, it, 
you guys, you're really optimistic. You know, you, I see that uh, you see this uh, really, really nice push. Well, let, let's 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 try to change something. But but what if they have to do that? They can uh, companies can buy reserved instances in AWS. Like if you're buying servers, well, read the documentation, read everything, and you will find out that you can actually get like seventy percent discounts. If you if you buy something for three years in advance, or if if uh, uh, there are things like spot instances where you can actually get a, a fifty percent discount, like for for uh, for uh, vi virtual machines which are not used by other customers in AWS, so you can actually have some kind of recipes. But re in reality, people are not really reading everything uh, uh, in uh, in detail. So. There are many ways to get discounts in AWS. And also through partner channels, it's possible to get some kind of a, a discounts and, and credits for, from AWS. It's not easy. It's just a boring procedure, but it's possible. Okay. Yeah, the, the biggest issue, the biggest issue with, with customers is to convince them to try to explain to them that cloud migration is not just another IT project on the checklist that they have, yeah, right? Yeah. It's a true, it's a part of the true digital transformation of the company. Many departments are affected, like uh, the way your uh, sourcing and procurement teams are working, the way your program managers need to start thinking differently now, uh, the way your uh, finance and budgeting now works from, you know, CAPEX, OPEX uh, discussions. So it is a really changing a lot of, a lot of things. And, uh, they can't be thinking we're just gonna move and that, that's some internal IT stuff like this server here, that server there, it's nothing, it's, it's the same thing for us. Uh, they need to go away from that mentality. Otherwise migration is not gonna be successful. It's still gonna be garbage somewhere else, much more complicated garbage. Yeah, on, on that, absolutely. And, I, and that's exactly the thing. The insight is you're moving because you want to be in an environment where you can completely um, innovate and, and, and do other things, you know, and it, it's not about that thing. Like it's somehow, okay, we are just, it's just a cost point or we, and, and we need to do it, or it's now the thing that needs to happen. It's like, this is the environment you want to be in to have a much better environment and future. So you can actually become a, actually a different company and, and yeah, that it takes a lot of courage, yeah, obviously. So let, let's try not to not to get these uh, people really afraid of moving to the cloud. Let, let, let's let, let's try to 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 keep it like this because otherwise, if we start putting more more uh, uh, stuff in, uh, why is it so? Uh, uh, total transformation of the company, we may actually scare some people in this conversation. So yeah, that, that you're right. That's that's a tra real transformation. So let let's go to, to other stuff like uh, uh, how much time it will take. Like we have uh, uh, many many uh, recipes and it's not easy. But obviously you were talking about uh, moving us uh, just a piece of it, and mo then moving like a, a, a large uh, 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 pieces of software. So uh, uh, there are many recipes on how to do these things. You know. So uh, uh, obviously one of the, uh, the solutions is, is to move everything and then see what's going on. Another thing is to just pick a, pick a simple thing and then do it in a, in a totally cloud native way. So, but in general, how do you feel like if, if, if there is a company that has its own IT, uh, some, uh, uh, using some internal ERP and many companies are relying on other technical companies that, that deliver them software. So, how can I really uh, uh, end this transformation ever if everyone in this chain is, is not moving to the cloud? So if my technical uh, provider of the, of the ERP is not doing any, any steps, then it's got, not gonna happen. So you probably need to lift and shift some of the things. So uh, let, let's split this answer to this uh, uh, question to, to different things. Like how, how much time does it take to make a proper template for a, small uh, a website that's like a like a side website in some company like hr website in a company for example and and then well do it uh, do it properly in the cloud and see how it looks like to, to move in the cloud and 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 let's also uh, as, a, as a second as a second game let, let's talk about the 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 moving lift and shift uh, uh, lift lift and shift recipe of moving an erp to the cloud with the sql server 
So how do you feel like, how much time would a company need, like a small, medium, 100, 100 people company would take to, to, to move through of these things? The first one includes learning about stuff. The second one means just probably install a, a virtual machines and stuff like that. So how, what would you say to a client? How much time do I need? I think it. I think it depends. So it depends on the size of the company because the big, the big unknown is the organizational impact. Um, everything from education, but also just getting organized and everybody on the same page, especially in large companies. That's the big, big thing. Um, to answer your question about the, let's say the infrastructure's code for these things. Let, let's assume for now that they, they don't have a custom weird system for, for a website or for an ERP system. These are easy to do. So let's say in a, in a one to 10, one to a hundred or one to a thousand compared to the organization time. So, you know, like the technical side is, is you know, way easier to put in place. And then you have a migration of let's say data and just switching over. And then you have like the bulk, which is more organizational. That, that's kind of how it is. And then it depends on the size of how big system are we moving and how many users. Yeah. How so does is, is this a stupid is question? That? Is this a stupid question? Can we actually <laughs> end, end the process? Is there an end in this game, like moving to the cloud? Uh, so I think that is the actual, that's better question. <laughs> <laughs> I would say the, the first one was stupid, but this one is better. Uh, probably there is probably to be fair, uh, probably there is no end. Um, uh, and the reason why there is no end is um, two things. First, clouds are evolving all the time and are bringing new services in uh, in place that are better than the previous services. And you want to uh, get the benefit of using the new services and leverage all of that. So you start modifying uh, as well. <clears throat> the second thing is what I really like about the cloud is it doesn't allow you to have technical depth anymore because don't forget any kind of uh, a service in AWS uh, supports usually four to five <clears throat> previous version of, of that particular software, be it uh, Kubernetes or Kafka or um, uh, Oracle server, whatever, so, or, or Lambda with uh, Node.js and Python support. It's usually three, four, five uh, uh, levels of um, uh, previous versions. So you can't have your Lambda running on a deprecated version of Python or JavaScript, uh, it will stop working. So basically they, the cloud will force you to keep up with uh, latest technology stack. So the once you move to the cloud and you say, okay, now ha I'm happy with it, you will continue to manage that stack. Uh, but this time you will manage it properly and you will be keeping it up to date. And this is a, this is a good thing. This is how you should be even taking care of your IT environment on premise, but just companies neglect that. Uh, going back to how much time uh, it will take, uh, I, I usually like to uh, give customers a view that they should take baby steps here, right? There is no running because uh, uh, everybody that I've seen uh, sprinting to the cloud, they they fell down and broke the nose, and there is blood everywhere, and it's uh, uh, and they die after that. <laughs> baby steps, okay. uh, really. Uh, step by step, because there is a lot of learning to be done along the way, uh, a lot of internal changes uh, that need to happen. And um, when you mentioned about this, like a, uh, some website to spin up, I mean, that's that's easy thing. I mean, I can give you scripts to spin up uh, uh, easy websites uh, in, uh, in two minutes, but you know, that's not the point. The point is that you understand what is the dependencies, what are the applications that together with that website need to move. Your ERP uh, question, I would go back and ask like, well, why do you need to move the ERP system? Can you not maybe buy the software as a service from that company that you're using it? I mean, now all uh, previous ERP big players have their solution in the cloud and offer software as a service. Yeah, but just the, that thing that you just said, like. Uh, uh... Just look at look around. I mean, you say that most of them have a, a, a software as a service solution, but are you really aware of the reality of the companies that are working in the market for like 20, 20 years? They're not really that hyperactive as 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 you as you just said. Like in in the, in the, uh, in Central Eastern Europe, like it's just 
it's, it's just a nightmare. No one uh, offers a software service instead of their current ERPs. It's just very rare. Like, uh, and also if you look at the SAP and the stuff and the companies like that, even that, these big, big players, they're not really moving fast. They're just trying to slow you down by moving to Sabhana and stuff. So are they actually moving? Do we have option? That, that's the question. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, you know, take Salesforce, for example, right? Um, uh, take uh, Office 365. I mean, um, companies are not anymore installing and managing a fleet of email servers. They just move to Office 365 and, and use it. So that's, that's, you wouldn't move Exchange servers from on-premise to AWS and say, now we're in the cloud with our email system. Microsoft um, is doing a baby steps on moving the vision to the cloud in the, I mean, baby steps, 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 stops, but it's, it's, it, they never finished. Like uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's almost there. It's uh, there's another version and stuff, but it's, it's uh, there is a question from there and here. Yeah. Are there some clients that you would not advise to move to cloud is on-premise better option for some clients? Yeah. Uh, it, it's a very good question. Um, I would say um, to answer that, uh, if you don't have, uh, maybe, maybe Tommy, you have another opinion, but if you don't have uh, executive sponsorship in your company to move the cloud, then stay on premise. <laughs> don't yeah. try to, don't try to move to the cloud because uh, this affects the whole company. And if there is no mandate from the top to move uh, to cloud, you will probably not be successful. So you can be a little enthusiast uh, in, a, in a team or a little uh, team uh, in the IT department that moved something to the cloud and trying to persuade everybody how it's great. But if there is no strategic decision to move to the cloud, then don't waste time, right? So stay on premise until CIO changes. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, how but do you persuade them to uh, uh, these these guys in the top? Uh, well, we have to move. Uh, would you uh, say so sometimes you can't? Sometimes you can't. Yeah, I mean, sometimes yeah. you, you tell them all the cloud benefits. You say everything that um, uh, you're supposed to say, and sometimes you can't because sometimes they have hidden agendas you're not aware of. Uh, sometimes they're uh, like a C level executives. They are uh, hopping from one position to another. They are here three years to publish to pol polish the CV and then go to a better place. And they're not really interested in ten year migration of anything anywhere, right? And you don't know these things. And sometimes when you see these kind of blocks, uh, it's better to give up, right? On the other hand, there are, let's let's be fair to other customers. So I've spoken to some CIOs who, like after thir thirty minutes, they said like no more talking this is it right let's let's go and uh, and then the whole company starts moving and there is zero resistance so they're both camps yeah i also fully agree there you, you have to have have uh, <clears throat> top top level um support for this because it, it is a it's a company it's a business decision to do that it's not like a okay the it can do something you know it's not like a excursion for it it's it's a company thing yeah. So one question related to like how much time it will take and also the previous question about the price. Uh, would you agree like that, that, the, that the possibility that you can always make it cheaper in the cloud is one of the, uh, the, 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 the biggest motivation to, to improve and, and, and make stuff? Because like whatever I, I do, like there's always another option that I can cut costs, I can cut costs, you know, but opti by optimizing uh, uh, you can actually get to uh, like cloud is promising almost zero. So do 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 you see that that's one of the points that you can sell to someone? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <clears throat> I mean, uh, to, to uh, uh, it, it would be it's a common sense, right? To say uh, it's going to be cheaper if you move there and to do it uh, like that. But uh, you would be surprised how many companies do not care about if things are cheaper, right? Um, they have enough money. They have enough IT budget. Uh, uh, doesn't matter if it's uh, if it's cheaper or not. Uh, there are other drivers that they are interested in, and cost is often not one are of. Are you the talking drivers. about Swiss banks, or is that just <laughs> no. the rest of the market? <laughs> uh, the, there are different customers from different yeah, countries okay. and different okay. verticals. It's not just uh, it's, it's not just Swiss bank. Uh, I mean, Swiss banks are in tough situation. They would actually really think about cost, but. Um, <clears throat> But its cost driver is 
it is there, but it's usually not first priority. There are others like, you know, agility and uh, 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 fighting with the competition that, that are uh, cloud born companies and that are eating part of your cake. And if you don't do anything in 10 years, you're out of the business. Right. And then, you know, it doesn't matter how much it costs. Yeah. It's like if you're out of the business, you're out. And um, so that's that's my, I don't know. Yeah. You do okay. So let, let's let's sell something which is more expensive, like a, like a really premium stuff, not 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 cheap. Because because sometimes when we talk about lambdas and other stuff, we are just always talking, oh, well, it's going to be almost zero and, and really cheap. But, you know, you don't want to sell like that. It's, yeah. But, but also, like, I mean, this is so important, but like also what I said before, like, Think, think how much an engineer costs per day or, you know, yeah. or, or a month or whatever you want to put in. Like it, it, you need to look at the holistic view. You know, you can't just say Lambda and you have some free tier and whatever and think it's zero and low or low cost. Um, that's just <clears throat> very, very, um, how should I say, um, basic. You need to look at the overall. And, and, and also if you're migrating into cloud, like we talked now, now here, if you don't have support from, from the top, it's a large company. Even if you're saving costs running in cloud, how many years will it take to save it back? It's not your top priority. You have other priorities and so on and so on. Like if you're stacking things up, how much is it gonna cost to, to um, re-architect and rebuild this COBOL application you have that runs all the Swift you know, transactions that nobody knows since 20 years, but it seems to be running. How, how, what's the cost to, to build that as uh, serverless? You know, um, it's, it's uh, very difficult to, to, um, yeah. so I that, think that, look at yeah. the cost, you know. It's Maybe we have another money. question here is like, for every country, for every, every uh, uh, society, maybe we should ask ourselves, what is the, the oldest stack that we have in production? And, uh, and by, by, if you see that, Maybe you can actually see like what kind of a, what what level of the problem we have, and uh, uh, if we ever going to get rid of some problems, how hard is it to to get to get rid of some cobalt stuff and and really 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 old stuff. So let let's go to the next question. It's uh, uh, it's Kubernetes or something AWS native. So uh, uh, Kubernetes is a packaging for uh, uh, for 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 the set of small services. So they can work together in the cloud. So you can you can actually set up a, a Kubernetes a cluster in your uh, own uh, uh, network, but you can also deploy it to the cloud and stuff like that. So it's kind of a, a, a multi-cloud solution that can work anywhere. But on the other side, you have really native stuff which work only in that particular cloud. So what is your opinion? Like, what would you suggest to the customer? Uh, in, in most cases, like what, what, what is the best way to go to multi-cloud thinking or really dedicated to a single single solution? I mean, everything depends. Every, every single question. Yeah, and I, know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I know it's hard, but so, just so that, that, that's yeah, the starting yeah. point. Have... There is no, absolutely no one answer to anything, but let's just say in general, how I look at it, this is that when you're talking about containers, there are clear benefits for, for that in terms of actually the whole life cycle of, of working with containers and being anywhere from your developer machine to any cloud or any hosting or anything. That, that's a very interesting thing. And you don't need to just have Kubernetes, you can have something else, which also means Kubernetes is quite heavy duty. You know, so it does, in my view, it is used too many times when you don't need such heavy duty uh, thing. And it's also quite complex. Um, on the other side, we have Lambda, which is, is obviously, I mean, you have conceptually, we have the same thing everywhere. You have it, you know, it's, it's a cloud function. It's just yes, a function. Exactly, exactly. So, so Azure functions. And yeah, so, so, and that's, that can be on any level, but my view on it is that, and this is also, I, I think if you look at existing systems, there are very few, very large deployments, very, very, you know, big and, and, and let's say complex uh, with lambdas, just lambdas, like these functions. It gets very difficult also to maintain and, and, and deal with. And, but this is a bit of a rabbit hole to go into so, uh, for another time. But what is good with lambdas is that you can just have one. It's very quick, it's very very nimble, very very lightweight compared to say, hey, we need a you know, Kubernetes cluster and we need you know, you know, that. So they're, they're a, bit, a little bit on, on, on this 
heavy versus light, but obviously they kind of try to do the same um, overall if you if you push it. So it depends, right? It depends. What is it that we are building now? You know, and yeah. and and is AWS lock in a problem? Like exactly, in, in exactly. Picture, yeah. Know, so what what how do you feel about lock in? That no, that, that term. It's is low it on the overrated? list. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's yeah. so I I try to also with myself be very mindful about fear uh, opinions or fears or, or and and try to be in a rational domain where you're looking at things and I think a lot of things around data security uh, lock in even costs are more like fear things. It's not really you don't quantify it and think about it enough so you see does it matter like hey I pay like ten developers. And now I'm talking about optimizing Lambda versus Docker. You know, you know, like the costs are, you know, a blip in the in the universe. You know, so it, it, it's it's um, lock-in. I don't, I for certain um, industries this is this is um, important. For certain businesses this is important. Uh, we could pro probably talk about that separate. But um, I think for most companies this is not the main problem that business has. Yeah, my my view on this multi-cloud story would be is uh, I still haven't seen any customer uh, or or a project that is really using um, something like Kubernetes or or doesn't matter uh, to have a true multi-cloud deployment. By true multi-cloud deployment, I, I uh, referring to you have application that can seamlessly be running today on AWS, tomorrow on Azure, and you don't even know where it is running. It's moving between the um, uh, orchestration engine is throwing it to worker nodes here and there. I haven't seen it. And to be honest, I don't see the point uh, of that. Uh, I'm more for the right cloud for the right job, right? So uh, if you're going to use Office 365, don't try to bring that on AWS. Just go to Azure and use it. It's native over there. If you need Active Directory, use Azure AD and then federate into AWS after that. But uh, don't try to make something that can seamlessly run today on one cloud and tomorrow on a, another cloud. I don't think that works. I haven't seen that working. Uh, and if you want it to work, you have to go back 15 years and in time and use only virtual machines that are the, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the same thing in that cloud or this one cloud. But yeah, yeah. all the managed services above that, all the abstract services, cloud native services, they are all different among clouds. You, you can now argue and say, well, there are tools, third party layers on top of all the clouds that uh, can, um, let's say, uh, make it abstract like Cloud Foundry or um, uh, uh, I think there are a few, few others, I don't know. But the thing is you are, locking yourself into that layer and their APIs. And yeah, yeah. Why, why, do you, yeah. Yeah, so why do you trust a company of 150 people that is building, I don't know, Cloud Foundry and you don't trust people like AWS where there are hundreds of thousands yeah. of engineers and building it. So these discussions for me uh, are not, uh, uh, yeah. have no ground. Okay. So just the, the answer would be like, uh, just take the best of, of any 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 solution that you have, and uh, don't think about locking in too much because you can always move. Whatever you use, if you decide, you will move, and that's yeah. It. It's a it's a cost. The the yeah. there is no locking. There is the only cost of migration, right? So, yeah, exactly. Uh, you can always move. The the question is how much that would uh, cost you. But uh, uh, the thing is, with the locking, there is always locking. Even if you're on premise, yeah, whatever that, yeah. you're locked in in uh, a type of language you're using, type of database, type of uh, networking devices that you're using, and the end, end of day you're locked in with your people, with a team. If it's a .NET oh, yeah. team, that team will never be developing Java application. You're locked into right. .NET. You know? Of course. So okay, next question: uh, security. Uh, I have some sensitive data. I can't just give them to some filthy rich American cloud boss. Of course, we, we know who the, who the who the filthy rich American cloud boss is, and uh, how much money he left to his ex-wife. So uh, uh, so who they who are we? Re should we really be afraid of for, for our data? I mean, uh, uh, is security uh, in cloud uh, better or worse than uh, than uh, than than the and on premise and uh, what's going on? I mean, uh, there are some risks. There, there are some like 
break-ins and stuff like that. But who is to blame? And uh, there are some kind of terms like uh, uh, that there's a there's a security on side of cloud and security on side of client. So is it secure or not? Just give us the answer, guys. Yeah. So it's, it, 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 it again depends, of yeah. course. But, and, and as we know, the other thing here, which is in addition to it depends, is that it's um, secure. Nothing is secure 100%. So there's just some degree of what you're capable of and can afford to put in place of somebody who might you know, try to do something. So, but the, the, the real answer, obviously, is that, again, do you think that your company, again, maybe it's a small company, can afford or should afford or should spend for the best of the best security experts to to do that job yeah i can just buy a new antivirus software that's it <laughs> or are you buy and and use best practices together with you know competent yeah. partners to secure your data on cloud so that that's like the starting point and obviously then if you follow best practices you get to some degree of security but then again like you know we can read every day if you follow what's happening in the security space you know, there was just recently a breach where somebody was um, uh, breaking in and stole um, uh, encrypted data from AWS. And the reason was simply because, well, the keys were around. So even if you have things encrypted, doesn't mean it's safe. It just, you know, where are the keys and, and, and how does it work? Do you, do you rotate keys? You know, how do you deal with your whole entire um, setup, which of course includes people? So where's the biggest risk? Probably it's going to be in some laptop that you run some tests and this and that and you know your employees that work remote and you know so. <clears throat> but that yeah, but in that case, then it really doesn't matter where you host uh, your application and data if uh, uh, if people are your weakest uh, chain in the link, you know, then you're in jeopardy anyway. I think cloud, the security in the cloud is a totally different topic and we can talk about it for, for days, but uh, if used properly, it is very secure. Uh, you have a lot of controls that you can put in place. Um, however, I always have to say like, um, there needs to be a level of trust when you're uh, working with in a partnership with vendor such as a cloud provider, right? I mean, you, you trust uh, uh, Salesforce with all of your uh, uh, company uh, employee information. You trust uh, uh, Microsoft Active Directory with um, all the usernames and passwords. Uh, there, is, there is Office 365 with all of your emails. So there is always a level of trust with the vendors that you need to have. If you have a zero trust strategy, and I have seen that as well, it can be done. You need to use on-premise HSM devices that generate the keys. You use these keys to import in the, in the cloud in uh, uh, KMS, and then you do stuff. Then you destroy the KMS, and next time you need the data, you do again. But you're reducing yourself to a limited set of use cases for what you can use the cloud. There needs to be a certain level of, of trust. Now, when we talk about this trust, don't forget that... Um, cloud is being audited all the time uh, exactly. for for any kind of uh, i would say uh, that are global or local uh, compliances and uh, and standards and all the cloud vendors are compliant with with all of them and you can just imagine uh, i always keep saying that the the things you read in the newspapers is the things that customers have misconfigured in the cloud you have never read i would say for any of the cloud as i'm aware of that there was a breach inside yeah. cloud, um, a, a part that vendor is responsible for. If that would happen, be sure that this would be all end, over yeah. all of the news and that's the end for that vendor. Now, can you imagine AWS that is 50 yeah. billion uh, company per year with tens of thousands of employees can afford to do that? They would probably think about security million times more than you do on premise. So it's a good thing about when you deal with the with the stuff like cloud formation and then the CDK over over cloud formation, which is the, the framework to, to build uh, uh, infrastructure as a, as a as a real code, is that uh, you start with zero permissions on on everything, and then you add just the minimum of it, uh, and and there is stop there is a, there is some guidance like a well architected and uh, uh, framework in AWS. 
you know, and 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 the implementation of that in CDK, where whether whether just driving you to give the minimum level of permissions uh, when it's needed. Uh, so I, I would really uh, strongly suggest to anyone moving to the cloud, please don't open everything just because you you don't know how to deal with this stuff. Just go step by step and. Uh, if you open just doors which are absolutely necessary, then you will be safe in the cloud. So uh, let's go to the next step, uh, 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 back to school, like value of certification in AWS. So so just a quick answer. W w w do you see the value of, of go going through the certification uh, uh, of, of AWS? I think so. I mean, my view is it definitely depending on, on, on your aspirations or what you're looking looking um, if you're looking to be employed I think definitely and before that if you're looking to um, let's say just follow a path of you know at least pushing yourself to to also read all the the other details that not just what you're doing maybe on, on the job I, I think it's it's very valuable but definitely for for being employed it gives gives some level of comfort that where is this person so when I'm at least also interviewing for startups, this is definitely something I'm, I'm looking at because I know what is um, required or the level of conversation you should be able to have with somebody with certifications. And then it's the, then, you know, easier to also filter. So I, I do definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I do see partially. So uh, the thing is, I think whoever is, let's say working, I'm now using AWS as an example, uh, should get at least a uh, solution architect associate level certification because it gives you like the uh, uh, first high level overview of what is out there uh, and forces you to start thinking in a certain way. Uh, over time, solution architect professional level would also be good, but I wouldn't go much further than that. I wouldn't go into the over certification phase. Yeah. Why? Because it takes too much time and it's a still a theoretical exercise. So uh, you can easily get certified without ever opening console of AWS, right? Any certification you can get uh, by just uh, uh, reading what was from the previous years, previous exams, uh, different A Cloud gurus videos showing you how to click, click, click. It's theoretical. For me, uh, the best way is get solution architects associate level. You can do it in a month. I would say if you're starting from scratch, uh, watch a cloud gurus, get theoretical knowledge, do it from that moment on start hands on implementation of your pet projects of exploration. There is no substitute for practical uh, experience. Uh, forget about this theoretical stuff. Yeah, that's okay. for sure. So it's let's go to the next step. Uh, but uh, uh, there, there are some companies like uh, that, that do like, uh, let's certify everyone with a cloud practitioner. Let's certify everyone in the company just for, for the people to embrace the cloud, just to understand what are we doing? That kind of thinking, that's also- uh, I would, instead of that, I would say, give every employee account on AWS with a, um, a budget set to $50 or $100 that they cannot exceed and let them explore themselves. Uh, and, uh, and with a very easy initial one week of training uh, so that they know where to look for stuff, uh, I think it would have much better effect than- yeah. But what, uh, what about this uh, like a business, business part of the company? Like uh, how will, uh, there are some some good trainings in, in a, cloud, a cloud guru uh, uh, about the business view of the cloud. Like how do we uh, perceive uh, the value of the cloud and uh, stuff like that? How would you like persuade your CEO, CIO, or, or someone to to get in the cloud? Like we, you need to train them about something, you know, because they won't trust people from inside the company or. No, maybe I mean, a, a cloud cloud practitioner for the business. It's I think it's good just that you start talking the same language with yeah, yeah. with with IT pro who are uh, working in the cloud. So when they say I put something on S3, they know what S3 means. Uh, exactly. But uh, uh, yeah, the, it won't take them much further than that. So to have a common language, I think that that is valuable. that's good. But some some other some other yeah, the iCloud Guru has some nice stuff for for. for businesses on the cloud. So 
I would recommend that. I so also let, let, maybe sorry. to add to that, I think there, there are quite a few reInvent videos that are perfect for, for I mean, not all of them at yeah. all, but some are completely business on the spot, how to think as a business around some, some successful deployment. Is it now around AI or you know, how you're using a fleet of, of, of spot instances for EC2 okay. on scale? Really so I, I've heard that there are two guys on the internet that are doing some cool stuff. So at the end of this presentation, we'll, we'll show you what, what Nemanja and Tommy are doing on the internet on YouTube channel. So how they uh, uh, present, the, how they introduce you to the cloud and help you guys. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll do that at the end. So let's skip, let's, uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, so do I need to rewrite all my code and all my other apps? So we were talking about a bit uh, uh, of everything during this conversation, but uh, uh, there, it seems that there is a, even if you are moving, you're actually not moving, you are, you are redoing, you're rewriting, you always need to re, restart everything. So, I mean, that, that's a lot of work, you know, it's, it, it's hard. So yeah. we need to. You don't, you don't need to rewrite all of your code, of course. It is, uh, you know, that, that's what I mentioned earlier. You do the application inventory, and then you just mm -hmm. you make a decision uh, which applications can just be moved, lift, and shift the way they are without any modification. You, you will just have a different endpoint pointing here instead of there. No changes at all. And then some applications that are actually worth re rewriting. Uh, you know, in a lot of companies, even if you're staying on premise, there is a, a lifespan of an application, right? After a certain period of time, they start rewriting it because it was written in COBOL, for example, and they can't find COBOL developers to maintain it anymore. So they start rewriting it in Java or .NET or whatever. So uh, you have to rewrite from time to time some of your business critical applications Anyway, it doesn't matter if they're on premise or yeah. in the cloud, but uh, not all, definitely. It's like if you're doing it all, then uh, it's going to really take you a long time. Um, so, um, yeah. so we de definitely need to rewrite. So, the, uh, are there uh, the the rest the APIs here to rescue us for the for the next like fifty years? Can we just say that if we do everything as an API, uh, like Daniel said in in a, in a, in a in a note in the in the chat, uh, like uh, if you use a REST API to connect to Salesforce, to Twilio, or any other service, I mean that that's fine. You, you, you're using any any cloud, or you don't care where it is. And is it enough to to if we build applications around APIs like Amazon is doing, that it's going to be like future uh, safe for us for the future? <clears throat> Uh, I would be Tommy now. It depends, okay. <laughs> and <laughs> it is it depends because. Um, uh, you know, some of the companies uh, are under um, strict regulations, right? So uh, if you're a, a credit card processing company, you need to follow PCI DSS standard in order and you need to be compliant to that uh, in order to operate. Otherwise, auditors will shut you down, mm -hmm. right? And there you have to be careful where this REST API endpoint is, right? If the regulator is saying this cannot be in uh, Beijing, in China, uh, for whatever reason, or it cannot be outside of Europe or outside of US, right? Then you do care where the REST and, and API uh, point is, right? Yeah, but inside uh, your company, if you, are, if you are rewriting the code, is it smart to just do that, to just to move to APIs right now? So, well, yeah, but the thing is, you know, the REST API is an architectural style, right? There is another one yeah. called GraphQL. The question is, what is better, REST API or GraphQL? Do you have developers that understand uh, GraphQL? And um, uh, should you use GraphQL at the end of the day? And things like that. So these are all uh, uh, discussions. I mean, definitely there is a benefit of integrating different sources of information through some kind of APIs <clears throat> instead of direct point to point integration, because you end up in a mesh situation where because everybody talking is talking about to everybody. Like the, all these like the last 20, 30 years of stack are done. With, I mean, in many cases, there is just two layers between the front, uh, between the, 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 the Windows application and the database. There's so many ERPs or stuff like that, that doing with that with the, you know, uh, uh, store procedures and database, stuff like that. So maybe it's time to do I'm, that uh, in, internally sure. on premise and, and then to move. 
And don't forget, I mean, we are, we are in the API world, right? So you can monetize yeah. your APIs. If you have a very Good. cool function Good that point. is working be behind the API, even on AWS Marketplace, you can sell your API endpoints so that every request you're receiving money for, uh, for people making requests. If you have some cool calculations doing whatever, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> if I knew what to do, I would be selling something. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. and uh, <clears throat> so uh, definitely there is a value in that. Yeah, and I think it's it's about conceptually APIs definitely will be there. It's more like what what are the technologies behind that? Like it completely depends and and, and what, and also on the timeline. So, like, if you have a fifty-year horizon, for sure, I would I wouldn't bet too much on JSON because we can just look back and think XML, and probably everybody cringes, or SOAP, even worse. So, I think you know API is like um, it's native internet to be um, distributed or decentralized, if you so want, and that's through APIs, through interfaces. So that's for sure. But then what technologies will stay longer and what, what's new. Yeah. Okay, so next question is, uh, can I stop paying my, my Oracle licenses now? And uh, the, the actual question behind this is, well, look, uh, we are now paying something for, for these companies that we just, just taking money on every step around whatever we do. We are the one user, they're just taking money. We at one machine, one CPU, they take money. So. If I move Oracle database or, or uh, MS SQL to the cloud, will I stop paying for these things? Can can you can we just can I just pay something to the to the to the to AWS and stop thinking about the number of users, the number? What 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 is changing in that if we if I move up to the cloud? <clears throat> I mean, to start with, if you're dealing with Oracle in any way, you should start <laughs> thinking, rethinking your strategy. But uh, if moving to the cloud, let's say, um, yes, uh, in, in a, I'm now talking from the AWS perspective, uh, the Oracle licenses, uh, if you're using a uh, managed database uh, called RDS with Oracle Engine in um, AWS, uh, the, you can either bring your own license if you if you already have it, but if you don't, it will be included uh, in the RDS instance that you uh, that you make. So you will, as you're paying as you go uh, usage of RDS um, service with Oracle um, engine behind, you will also be paying uh, as you go with the uh, Oracle license. It's just included, you don't see it. Uh, so basically AWS bought licenses from Oracle and is selling you through the usage of RDS uh, service, right? So you will always know what you what you're going to pay. You, you, so no one, you don't have to be afraid of uh, some kind of you, you, Yeah, I mean, if you're using it as uh, uh, as built in uh, in RDS uh, when you when you start Oracle Engine of RDS, you don't even care about your uh, Oracle license. You, so is you it more expensive to run a, a MS SQL and Oracle in, in AWS than, than in their own clouds or on premise? There's, there's something going on about MS SQL. So, so yeah, so, so MS SQL is different to Oracle because Microsoft and AWS got into fight a few, a few years ago, and you can't bring your own license uh, to uh, RDS in AWS if you're using MS SQL as underlying engine, right? Uh, you can only procure this license uh, through the built-in uh, uh, Microsoft license through RDS. Uh, that's the only way. Um, the thing is, will it be more expensive or not? Uh, don't look at it through the licensing part, but look at it through when you start RDS uh, database, be it Oracle or MySQL or MS SQL or Postgre, it doesn't matter. You need to choose the power of that underlying server that is uh, so how many CPU, how much memory it, it, it is using. And this is your cost, right? And you can uh, exactly calculate the cost. Uh, I mean, it gives you per hour, right? And then you, you know how much per month you're gonna pay, how much per year, then you can lower it down with the reserved yeah. um, uh, uh, capacity. And, um, and, and so AWS you will not... is like saying that it's, it's, it's the, the Microsoft stuff runs better in AWS than in, in, in Azure Cloud. Yeah, because oh, Azure is running on AWS. <laughs> okay, okay, but they they they're selling that point that everything in Microsoft runs faster in in AWS. So yeah, 
So uh, we have just one minute more, and uh, uh, it's the last question. Is isn't isn't open source for hackers only? And uh, uh, one of the points that I wanted to make uh, here is like there's a service like now called uh, uh, Babelfish. It's in a preview now that allows you to map your PostgreSQL database, which is open source and free, and uh, to make it available to Microsoft SQL app uh, clients. So you can you have a feeling that there is a Microsoft SQL database there, but actually the uh, AWS is selling you Postgre database. So uh, it's it they're making it open source, so everyone is will be able to do that even on premise. You know, so obviously open source is not for hackers only. But uh, uh, you know, uh, if you are moving to the cloud, do you feel that people should move to more open source solutions, like especially for databases, or not? Um, should they I, I, think about that during this process? Should they should they change the database? I think that comes later. I mean, th this would be part of other kind of conversation. I mean, it, it's like this inventory, and then the you know what what are you lifting over? How are you evolving your your workloads and your applications? And maybe you have a conversation around why it makes sense to change the database, and then you figure out what's the answer. I don't yeah, think that's the starting point. That's down the down the road, unless there's a very <clears throat> special case where it's a database issue for whatever reason. But I I don't yeah. see that as connected <clears throat> with open source. This, this is not. Yeah, I agree. I, you shouldn't be thinking if it's open source or not open source. It doesn't really matter if it, if it's supported by AWS. They will make sure it runs and um, it, that it's patched properly. That uh, it scales properly. Uh, latest bug fixes and stuff like that. Uh, so, so they are managing for you and for the fee that you're paying uh, per usage. Uh, but uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about it. Maybe the only thing to add to that would be, uh, maybe you want to think about what's the incentive, which database uh, would AWS, if you are moving there, want to run? So, and we know which one that is, you know, it's their own Aurora. <laughs> so maybe you want to long-term think that that's what they're going to push most, which is probably true, so. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, guys. So this this leads us to the end. Uh, I mean, I had a lot of lot more questions, but any 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 question that I open, like it would just move us to a lot of different directions. And we didn't answer some of the things that we were talking about, like uh, uh, what are the benefits of having a, a AWS cloud in your country. And we didn't touch like more about government uh, stuff. We didn't touch so many things, but well, there is a lot of time ahead so we'll have a chance to do that so uh, I'll, uh, I'll take this opportunity to uh, to show uh, uh, everyone on the uh, uh, watching this a bit from your uh, videos that, that you do and uh, I strongly suggest uh, uh, people to watch it it's a, like a short form five minutes stop like now and uh, uh, or maybe ten minutes sometimes so uh, you're trying to show us what give us the answers to, to, to some more technical topics, uh, but 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 in the beginning you started with a lot of business stuff and also about cloud migration and, and, and stuff like that. So guys, sorry for for not asking you all the questions, and uh, uh, see you next time. Thank you very much for thank you, thank you, uh, helping, helping us helping me to to guide to walk through this stuff, and uh, uh, also uh, I want to call everyone to uh, to another meetup that I will will have in like fifteen days. And uh, uh, just take your uh, uh, shot and uh, uh, final, let, let's get rid of this uh, uh, disease. And on April 29th, we'll have a micro with, uh, with us. We'll talk about many different services, about events, uh, message uh, stuff and, and stuff like that. That's very so, good. Very good. That's good, right. guys. So uh, I'm going to play some, uh, uh, the, I'm going to play a video uh, and uh, uh, from YouTube and that's it. So bye bye guys, and uh, you can watch yourself. Uh, on, on I, I hope you, I hope you haven't messed with the video and put some funny <laughs> yeah. stuff. I think there is. Uh, le le yeah, let's let's look at this one and uh, let's play it. Mm. Ah, cool. Can we? Can I show? Uh, it's it's a bit slow. Is that now YouTube through the meetup? I think. It's... Maybe maybe just send the link. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Send the link. But, yeah. Send link. yeah, and everybody subscribe so we get a bit yeah. more. We need to reach hundred. 
Yes, so that we can get uh, some money to buy better uh, watermarks for the <laughs> for the board. You see. Good for our kids. Yeah, but, but the, it's great. It's Greek. a great form. Like it looks like uh, this is my architecture on AWS. So yes, uh, yes, and and we have lots of other ideas coming up. So uh, in this form, so we just uh, need to find time to um, to record it. But uh, yeah. yeah, it's coming. So yeah. Everybody just subscribe to the channel and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.